Hey, First Unitarian. I am so happy to be back here with you this morning. Phew, what a summer, huh? So recently in our national discourse, much has been written about cancel culture, the state of affairs in which people are calling for the boycott, exclusion, loss of platform, and loss of employment of anyone who expresses racist or sexist behavior. On Facebook, for example, there exist now numerous groups dedicated to exposing people's racist and sexist posts to their bosses in the hopes of them losing their jobs. And one of the most prominent examples recently has been a boycott of Harry Potter merchandise because of the transphobic remarks J.K. Rowling has made publicly and repeatedly. A few weeks ago in response, 150 prominent academics and authors including J.K. Rowling, Gary Kasparov, Noam Chomsky, and Salman Rushdie, published an open letter in Harper's Magazine expressing concern that debate and free expression in this country are being stifled in the name of justice. But it's well past time we canceled certain ideas in our country, right? Racism, canceled. Sexism, canceled. Ableism, canceled. Homophobia, cis-centrism, classism, canceled, canceled, and canceled. Public distaste for these attitudes, attitudes and for systemic oppression is absolutely an improvement on the status quo, right? But what of liberalism and discourse? Our president says... One of the left's political weapons is cancel culture, driving people from their jobs, shaming dissenters, and demanding total submission from anyone who disagrees. This is the very definition of totalitarianism, and it is completely alien to our culture and our values, and it has absolutely no place in the United States of America. Now, you may not affirm the credibility of the source, but it is indisputable that plenty of Americans agree with him on this score. And from a slightly more level-headed standpoint, Ross Douthat in the New York Times says, under its own self-understanding, liberalism, which he means in the classical sense of equality before the law based on individual rights, says liberalism is supposed to clear a wider space for debate than other political systems and allow a wider range of personal expression. So you would expect a liberal society to be slower to cancel, more inclined to separate the personal and the professional or the ideological and the artistic, and quicker to offer opportunities to regain one's reputation and start one's professional life anew. Friends, Douthat also may not jam with your politics, but he's also not wrong. Liberalism, and its shorthand, freedom, in this country has traditionally meant that I should be able to say whatever I want about whatever I want, even if what I'm saying negates the humanity of another person. Hate speech is legally protected in this country. So, as we, as you use, navigate this question of how to address harmful speech that perpetuates systems of oppression, the issue isn't that we're not liberal enough. The problem for UUs in a denomination that was birthed out of the same intellectual stew as our nation with an emphasis on political and intellectual freedom is that our concept, our conception of liberality has historically been out of step with our values, whether we knew it or not. Because, as you use, when we consider this idea of freedom, we don't just need to consider our individual freedom to think and say whatever we want. If we're truly dedicated to the unity that makes us one, we need to consider what will make us free to pursue the connection and the joy that we find in community. And so, how do we balance the need for justice with a robust public? discourse. Last week, Reverend Alicia Ford urged us 
Guard your political and cultural imagination in the search for truth. And current political culture dictates that there is a tension here between canceling anyone who does not demonstrate sufficient wokeness and allowing the free exchange of ideas. And let me be clear that in the face of someone who insists on doing harm to vulnerable populations, our collective liberation does dictate that we place the safety and the voices of the most vulnerable at the center of our theology and of our actions. But I believe framing this discussion as justice versus free speech is counterproductive and misses the spiritual point. Because what I think our public discourse is missing, dear friends, is a narrative of repentance and redemption. From our universalist heritage, we have inherited the theology that is displayed here in this sanctuary, that all souls are sacred and worthy, and that salvation belongs to everyone in this lifetime. And if you take that notion seriously, then you can't entertain the idea that there are souls who are irredeemable, people who are irredeemable. And we know that that idea is right out of the empire playbook, the whole point of a society that divides people into acceptable and not is to concentrate power in the hands of the few acceptable. No, if we're truly in the liberation business, that framing isn't for us. So then what is our duty in the light of this? Do we need to weed out people who are perpetrating harm? Do our faith and our love compel us to stay in conversation with people who are not doing the work of dismantling white supremacy and continue their allegiance to the status quo. Well, when you begin to see the people who commit these unspeakable acts as people who have been so cut off from their own humanity, their own divinity, and our interconnection, that they don't recognize the damage they're doing in their communities, then what? James Baldwin said, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. Pain is, of course, not pleasant. And yet, in order to let go of hate and restore justice, we collectively, as human beings, have to be willing to lean into that underlying pain. Pain of having caused harm or had harm caused to us, pain of not being in relationship to the earth and to each other, pain of letting go of false and unjust narratives about others and ourselves, and pain of just not knowing how to fix this unjust and inherently violent state of affairs that we've been handed. Alpin also said, people pay for what they do and still more for what they have allowed themselves to become, and they pay for it very simply by the lives they lead. And so many people these days are living out over and over again the pain that they refuse to let go of. And in a week that saw yet another black man shot in the back, and a child armed and driven by his parents across state lines so that he could menace and murder Black Lives Matter protesters, why do we even care about cancel culture? Shouldn't the cops, the parents, and the kid be held accountable? Well, yes, they should. And we must leave room for redemption. We need to make space for an, I'm sorry, I was wrong, what can I help? What can I do to help fix it? And this is where the work that you are doing here at First Unitarian, particularly on the New Covenant, is so, so important. 
In the context of your discussions about racial justice, I've heard more than one person say, I'm just so scared to say the wrong thing. And that's valid. Saying something racially insensitive or downright racist when that was not your intention is uncomfortable and awkward. And if you're dedicated and doing your best to combat racism, it feels awful. And yet, in naming white supremacy culture and other oppressions in the covenant, what an opportunity. Because having it in the covenant means you're expected in good faith to screw up. You're expected to be called into covenant and to be allowed to try again. You are expected to fully live into your humanity as a congregation, and that means not being perfect, not knowing everything, allowing space for prophetic witness to take hold. In fact, living into covenant in this way means true freedom. It means you get to try your honest best, take your best shot in good faith at living in loving connection with each other, knowing that you can trust your community to engage you lovingly when you've strayed from the collective intention. And as you do the work of living into the covenant and listening to marginalized voices, you will not be canceled. This is true freedom, that you don't have to be perfect, that you will mess up and that you will be lovingly called to learn and grow and be accountable. And we get to practice this here so we can model it out there, where this kind of grace, love, and trust is in such very short supply. You don't have to live in constant fear of saying the wrong thing, because if you do, you have a way back in. Out there, you're canceled. Here, you are indisposable. Here, you practice the vulnerability that means you can address the pain that inequity masks. So why in a week when police shot a black man in the back seven times, and a child crossed state lines to murder two peaceful protesters and injure another, am I talking about cancel culture? Because what you're doing here right now in this community is vitally necessary in that very broken way. As you vote on a new covenant this fall, continuing your journey into calling white supremacy and oppression out and calling one another in, Keep practicing equity, love, vulnerability, and redemption, First Unitarian. The work you're doing here is desperately, heartbreakingly needed. Now, as the music plays, I invite you to, to discuss in chat, what do salvation and redemption look and feel like in your life? 